though the tempest is raging and the billows are tossing high, the winds and the waves shall obey thy will. 205. Stir the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high, the sky is all shadows with blackness, no shelter, no help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie asleep when each moment so madly is threatening a grave in the every day? The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Peace be still. Still, whether the wrath of the storm toss it, no demon or man, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the sheep where it lies, the master, the ocean, and it and sky. They all shall swiftly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall swiftly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. Master, the terror is all. The elements we live rest at sun in the calm lake is mirrored, and heavens within my breast linger, O oh, blessed Redeemer. Leave me alone no more. With joy I shall make the blessed harbor and rest on the blissful shore. The winds and the waves shall obey my will. Peace be still, peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm tosses. Or demon, or oh men, no whatever it be, no water can swallow the sheep who wait lies, the master or of fortune and death and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. 317-317 Every day we should be pressing on the upward way. Each day we should have an experience with God. God is faithful. God is not men that he should lie. So each day, if we are faithful, he will give us an experience. 317.
pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bow, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and I shall stand. By faith on heaven, stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay without surprise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven, stable land, the higher place that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to leave. Though Satan's doubts at me are held, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, plant my feet by faith on heaven stable land a higher plane that I have found Lord plant my feet on higher ground I want to scale the utmost high and catch a glimpse of glory bright, but still I pray to heaven I found. Lord, lift me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up, and I shall stand by faith on heaven. Stable land, behind the plain that I have found, Lord, plant my feet on high, Lord, lift me up, Lord, lift me up, and I shall stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher
I used to preach and teach your word, telling of salvation you've brought to men. But now it's gone and I don't know why. Send a revival into my life. Send a revival into my life. Jehovah, Jehovah, won't you please send a revival? Jehovah, Jehovah, send a revival into my life. Send a revival into my life. I remember the days I followed your ways. I prayed in the morning, in the noon and night. But now it's gone and I don't know why. Send a revival into my life. Send a revival into my life. Jehovah, Jehovah, won't you please send a revival? Jehovah, Jehovah, send a revival into my life. 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 I wake up. I wake up. I wake up. I get on my knees, I did learn from the master, he taught me to pray. I read on from the scriptures, the patience of Job, keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the redeemer and friend, the only comforter when you feel alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. When you get into trouble, lift up your head. And look up to the mountains where your help comes from. You surely have a refuge all night, all day. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend, the only comforter when you feel alone. He will be there. When you cry out, keep on your faith and live with hope. Why don't you trust in him? He's faithful and true. He promised to take us home on his soon return. Hold on and never look back. Believe in his word. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend, the only comforter when you feel alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend, the only comforter when you feel alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith.
faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. wasn't listening hard enough. Good evening, beloved. Ah, oh, now I hear you. Sound so beautiful. Did you hear the singing that was happening in this place? Did you love it? I want to hear you say amen if you enjoyed the singing. Amen. Yes, I enjoyed the music from the group, The Well, based in Chitungwiza, Zengeza. I enjoyed the congregational music provided by you, the congregation, and led out by the young man, Yamiko. Thank you so much. We are beginning our program in earnest now. I'll give you a decent welcome by and by. Allow us at this point to uh, get uh, uh, Dr. Kufa to lead us through the
the health talk. And then I'll talk a little about the health talk when he comes down, a health expo more like. But for now, please give a big amen as the good doctor comes forward. Amen. Uh, good evening, church. How are you this evening? Uh, please, may I get some response? Otherwise, I will disappear from here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we are going to have our health talk. And for our health talk today, we are going to focus on the importance of having a good, uh, healthy uh, breakfast. We are going to see uh, the benefits of, going, uh, of having a good, healthy breakfast. And then I will try to get practical and give examples of uh, foodstuffs that we can use uh, or that we can check uh, if we are to have a good, uh, healthy uh, breakfast. All right. Uh, so if we are to have a good day, uh, it's only fair that we have a proper preparation. Are we the church? Why? Because proper preparation will prevent poor performance. So breakfast is one of the most important meals of the day. And if we have a good breakfast, a good preparation for the day, then we'll be assured that we have a good uh, day, which is productive, holding all things constant. Uh, maybe I will persuade some of you to have a good health breakfast by listing some of the benefits of having uh, a good breakfast. So are there any health benefits uh, of eating a good health breakfast? Yes, they are, and they are a couple. And those are some of the benefits of having a good uh, health breakfast. Uh, number one is that as you go out throughout the day, you will be less irritable. I'm sure you have seen some people at work or even at school, they are easily irritated. Why? One reason is that they do not have a good uh, health breakfast. And then the second thing which most of us would like is that if we have a good health breakfast, we are going to be more efficient. Whether we are at work or we are at school, this will improve our efficiency. And then if we have a good health breakfast, supplying the body with all the necessary nutrients, we are going to be more energetic that will help us to improve the performance uh, during uh, the course of the day. And in one research which was done, uh, two groups of kids were taken. Some were given a good yacht breakfast, and then some were not given a, a not so good breakfast. And after a certain time, they were given a test, and those who had a good yacht breakfast were shown to have better test scores as compared to those who were not having uh, a good yacht breakfast. So before we beat up our children uh, for not bringing not so good results at home, uh, let's check if we are giving them a good uh, health breakfast because most of the times children leave the house in the morning without eating uh, anything. Then other benefits of having a good uh, health breakfast is that it decreases your chances of uh, getting chronic diseases. Uh, we have a number of chronic diseases which are increasing in our country uh, which are also called non-communicable diseases. Uh, for example, we have the cardiovascular diseases, we have the diabetes, uh, we have high blood pressure. Our research has shown that people who have a good yacht breakfast are at a lesser risk of developing uh, these chronic diseases. Why? Because a good yacht breakfast, it helps with weight management. I have met a number of people who say, I want to lose weight, so what am I going to do? I'm going to miss uh, or I'm going to skip my breakfast. It's not a good idea. For you to be able uh, to manage your weight well, you need a good yacht breakfast. Why? Because if you have such, it will supply with the necessary nutrients throughout the whole day, and there will be no need to snack in between our meals. And then another advantage of having such a good health breakfast is that it increases our lifespan on earth. And as if that is not enough, it also increases the quality of life so that we might live more to save our Lord. And then the last point uh, is on better health. Then, having seen that there are a number of benefits, to having this thing called a good yacht breakfast. Why is it that a number of people, or most people, do not take breakfast serious? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Number one is that people do not have time in the morning. And one reason is because people sleep late, uh, maybe watching television, uh, watching soccer, UEFA Champions League, and you go to bed at 12 in the morning. Then the next morning you wake up late, you can't prepare the breakfast, you are late for work. So one reason is that is because people, they do not have time. So it's important for us to create time uh, to uh, have such a meal. 
Then number two is that people will not be hungry in the morning. Why are people not hungry in the morning? Because they would have eaten a large dinner. And by the time it gets to the morning, uh, the board sort of still has ample nutrients and you don't really feel hungry to eat breakfast. So very important that the way we structure our meals, even in terms of the quantities, uh, the dinner is supposed to be the one which is the most sparing as compared to the other meals. And then people want to lose weight. Like I said, it's not a good idea to say I will skip breakfast so that I control uh, my weight. Actually, it might become uh, worse. And then number four is that people do not realize its importance. But I hope that by now people who are listening to me uh, have, have an idea of the importance of a good health uh, breakfast, hence they are going to take it uh, serious. Then, uh, next slide. Uh, we want to know what makes a healthy breakfast. So breakfast should provide about 20 to 25 percent of our daily nutritional requirements. And it should provide about a third to one half of the daily calories. Why? Because in the morning, as we are going out to work, as we are going out to school, we need more energy to carry us out throughout uh, the whole day. Hence, we need to supply the body uh, with more uh, calories. And then just giving a demonstration of how we can structure our health breakfast. Uh, so that plate is about 22 centimeters. I'm sure you can see that. And it is divided into two halves. Uh, that's number one. And then after that, it's divided into, the other half is divided into two quarters. So the first quarter, we are supposed to put carbohydrates. That is where we have the whole grains. And then the second quarter, that is where we have our healthy protein. Then the other half, that one is supposed to be composed of fruits uh, and vegetables, which are very important even uh, for our health. Then going on to our setting, some people might ask you to say, uh, what are the different carbohydrate sources that we can have to have a good health breakfast in our setting? Uh, so we have different kinds of bread, or some bread particularly, that is the one which you recommend, which also has fiber, which prevents uh, even constipation. And then we have things like potatoes, we have things like brown rice, we have green peas, uh, we have salsa, which comes in different forms. It might be in the form of small grains, uh, or even in the form of maize. And if it's maize, it's best that we take mgaiwa other than the refined uh, mealy meal because it has got some nutrients removed in it. And then we can have cereals, uh, we can have madumbe, which are called yam in English. Uh, in this season, we can also have sweet potatoes. We also have things like mtakura. I'm not sure of the English name for mtakura. And then we also have things like whole grain pasta. So if we are to look at these carbohydrate sources, they have complex carbohydrates, which provide a constant supply of glucose even uh, to our body. So the human body requires glucose for it to function well, particularly the brain. Our glucose is the major fuel source uh, for the brain. So what happens is that we are supposed to maintain a certain concentration of glucose in our blood. And that certain concentration of glucose it depends on the type of sugar that we are going to eat and also the hormones which are secreted in the body. So generally speaking, what happens is that if we eat our refined sugars, which are mainly maybe in the form of glucose, our blood sugar is going to increase uh, as is shown by the red line. Can we see the red line? So as our blood sugar increases, uh, it's going to increase above the normal range. And then the secretion of hormones like insulin, uh, which act to control the blood sugar to retain it to within a certain range. So when we have uh, too much refined sugar, insulin secretion also increases, and then blood uh, glucose concentration quickly goes down. And as it goes down, as we can see uh, what is shown by the red line, you start feeling hungry. And as you feel hungry, you want something to eat. So that is the reason why people end up snacking even in between meals. Why? Because they have taken refined sugar, which quickly increases your blood glucose concentration. You increase insulin secretion. Your blood sugar goes down. You feel hungry. You want to take something to eat. So generally speaking, when you eat refined sugar, your blood glucose concentration is going to fluctuate. But when we eat complex carbohydrates, as is shown 
uh, by the green line, your sugar is going to be released from the digestive system slowly into the blood, and there will be less fluctuation of the blood uh, sugar concentration. So those carbohydrate sources that I've listed are very important because they provide complex carbohydrates which maintain uh, a constant level of blood glucose, and also they have fiber, which helps with constipation. And then, uh, maybe moving on to the protein sources. Uh, seems as if technology here, yeah? sorry. Uh, the protein sources that we have, uh, they come in different forms. We have things like beans, nuts, peanut butter, tofu, and soy products. And those are the different kinds of beans that we can use for that quarter of the proteins. And most of these beans, we actually find them here in our setting. Uh, most of them, we find them in Bari. It's a good shopping area. And then number 23, Bura Bura, uh, Robert Mugabe. We also find different kinds of beans which are healthy for us. I was reading somewhere where it was saying, uh, gram for gram, lentils actually contain more uh, protein than beef. And the other advantage of lentils is that uh, they contain less fat, uh, like, unlike the fat which is found in animal products, which is not so good uh, even for our health. Then the fats, we can get them in the form of avocados, nuts, uh, olive oil, if we can afford it. And then we also have uh, things like vegetable oil. I'm sure you have seen that on containers of lotions, they are actually avocados. And then as they ad advertise, they say in the lotion, there are oils which are good for the skin, but they would have been extracted from the avocados. So why not take the avocados and we get the oil straight from the avocados? Then our skin will be nice and smooth. And then uh, the other ones, we have uh, the fruits and vegetables, which we said are to constitute about half of the plate. Uh, and if we look at it, each and every season, we always have fruits and vegetables in abundance. Uh, can't you say amen to such a good Lord who provides everything that we need uh, even in season? And it is recommended that uh, for fruits and vegetables combined, we need about four to five savings per day. And according to the American Journal of Nutrition, this helps even to prevent cancers. Why? Because if we look at the fruits and vegetables, they have different colors. The different colors they have uh, is because of the antioxidants, is because of the phytochemicals, which are cancer-preventing uh, uh, substances, and they are very uh, good for us. And then those are the fruits and vegetables that we can have, even in the form uh, of fruit salad. Uh, so we see that is a watermelon that has been created to look like something which is not a watermelon. It's important to be creative as well. Why? Because we do not only eat with our mouth, but we eat with our minds as well. Then other important nutrients, we have got air, water, and sunlight. For air, you can go for a couple of minutes uh, without air. Then water, you can go for a, couple of, uh, for a couple of days. Then food, even for a couple of weeks. So air is the most important nutrient, even followed by water. Why? Because the human body, about 50 to 70% of the human body is made up of water. So it's very important uh, that we drink uh, enough water. Then last but not least, just taking a quotation uh, from Councils and Diet and Foods, page 173. Uh, it says, it is the custom and order of society to take a slight breakfast, but this is not the best way to treat the stomach. At breakfast time, the stomach is in a better condition to take care of more food than at the second or third meal of the day. The habit of eating a sparing breakfast and a large dinner is wrong. Make your breakfast correspond more nearly to the heartiest meal of the day. So we have known about the health benefits of eating a good health breakfast, and I hope we will be able, uh, or God will give us the strength even to implement this in our life. May God bless you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much to Dr. Kufa for that beautiful presentation that helps us keep us on track and in good shape as we look after our bodies and so our minds are clearer for God to communicate with us. I'd like to greet you all again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our theme for this meeting, as you may have known, for those of you that have been coming since the beginning of the series, which was on Friday last week, is Don't Give Up. 
Now we have a small way of uh, reminding each other of this theme. Uh, I say to you, gear up, and you say, don't give up. Let's try that together, everybody at one go. Gear up. All right, uh, there was a small disparity, but I think it's catching up. I think I was a bit louder than everybody else. Let's try to match where I'm at. Gear up. Don't give up. You must gear up. All right. Thank you so much. And that's what we're here to encourage each other through this series. And um, just a few announcements to let you know how we are going. Uh, we have a health expo. Dr. Kufa has just presented us with some health facts. But every Sunday and every Wednesday, beginning at uh, 1 o'clock until about the time that we begin here, 5.30, just outside this hall, outside the auditorium on the grass, on the grounds there, there will be some doctors and health specialists who are at your beck and call for you to ask them about your health. Free consultation. Your blood pressure can be checked, your sugar levels, your weight and uh, body mass index and all these things that you've always wanted to ask your doctor, but now you find an opportunity to sp uh, spare a bit of consultation fee. You just come in and you talk to them. Bring friends. It's absolutely, totally, completely free. Bring family and friends so they can do consultation. Just to let you know also that uh, this event that we're going through now is actually being recorded live uh, on the internet. Uh, I'm not sure that's the, technical, the technically correct thing, but I think the expression is it's streaming live as we speak. There is a code here. It's way too long for me to read it out, but they will beam it up on the screen for us to be able to note it down, and they'll send it via uh, social media so you can spread it to your friends. Anybody around the globe would be able to view all our proceedings as we go along. Those are the key announcements I wanted to remind you of. And just to let you know, every day we meet here at 5.30. The singing groups start and we join them in song service. Every day by about a quarter to eight, thereabouts, we are done and leaving. At this point in time, I'm going to invite our chorister to come and lead us in the opening song. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. We'll all stand up and sing it together with oomph, with energy, with zeal, realizing that indeed our source of strength is on the cross of Calvary. Let us rise as we are led in song. Straight after that, we'll have prayer offered and the rest will follow as planned. Thank you. Sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Oh, burdens are lifted at. Calvary, 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 burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near, cast your care on Jesus today live your worries and fear oh burdens are lifted at Calvary Jesus is very near oh burdens are lifted at Calvary Calvary, Calvary, oh burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near, troubled soul, the Savior can see, 
every heart at and tea. Oh, burden lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Oh, burden lifted at Calvary. Calvary. at Calvary Jesus is very near Wherever possible shall we all kneel down in prayer Our Father who art in heaven, we come before your throne this evening with the hearts that are thankful for the love that you have shown unto all of us. We thank you, Lord, for the promise that burdens are lifted at Calvary. We invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to come and minister unto us. We thank you, Lord, for your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in their midst to bless and to encourage them. At this moment in time, we want to commit all your children who have come to worship you with different burdens. We ask in a special way, Lord, that may you relieve us of all our worries and our concerns so that we may receive you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you, Lord, to prepare our hearts as we listen to your word. May you make it fertile ground so that as the word is sown, may the seed germinate, may it grow, and may it bring abundant fruit unto your blessing. We pray, Lord, that may you convict us of our sins. Speak to us, Lord, in a special way that we may receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, Father, we want to thank you for your servant whom you have chosen to break the bread of life this evening, Pastor Muyunda. We want to present him in a special way and a plead for your mercies. May you stand by him as he breaks the bread of life. May you use him according to your will. As the word is broken, may our hearts burn within us. May we be convicted and may we repent from our sins. Thank you, Father. Be with each one of us. Be with our visitors be with the children, be with everyone. May we feel your presence. For we pray all this in the name of the loving Son. Amen. I've compared you, oh my love, with the company of horses and chariots, and I've compared you, oh my love, with riches, silver and gold, and this love I have for you has made me cast all the splendor aside. And I've given my life for you. Open the door of your heart. Stay close to me all your life. Cause in me and in me alone. You have 
of peace in your heart for I've given my life for you open the door of your heart stay close to me all your life causing me and in me alone you have peace in your heart for I've given my life for Let me tell you of a love story How the king left the splendor And came to die on Calvary To save a sinner like you and me That through his death we may live Through his wounds we are healed There is no than this. I am telling of a love story how my Jesus left the heaven and came to die on Calvary to serve a sinner like you through his death you may live through his wounds you are healed will you open up your heart for him will you hear him when he say open, open the, the door, door of, of your, your heart stay with me stay close, close to me all your, all your life all your truth and the life you have peace in your, in your heart for I've given my life for you and today is up in heaven is preparing a place for you after which you surely come to take you up with him that way he shall be you be also no more death and no more pain there is no greater love than this yesterday is up in heaven and is preparing a place for you and I know he's coming again to take you up with him that way he shall be you be also no more death and no more pain there is no greater love than this will you hear him when he calls open Open the door of your, of your heart. Stay with me. Stay close to me. All your, all your life, all your life, goes in me alone. And in me, in me alone, you have peace in, in your, your heart. For I've given my life for you. Open the door, open the door of, of your heart. Stay with me, stay close, close to me all your, all your life, all your life. Closing me, I'm the way, me the alone. truth, and the life. You have peace in, in your, your heart. heart. For I've given my life for you. For I've given, for I've given, given my life for you. 
There is no more reason to for die For I've given my life for you For I've given, for I've given, given my life for slideshow. Uh, in a very special way. Uh, this evening, I would like to declare Osana in the highest because God still loves us. And I would like to pray that as we go into God's way today, we will get in and delve into His word in more detail. And I want to urge you to follow very closely. Because in our series, we are looking at the theme uh, that says, don't give up. Don't give up. My prayer is that all of us here present, who are willing to listen to God's word, will obtain mercy. Because the days we live in are evil. And so may you please follow very, very closely. Because today our message is entitled Three Corruption Degrees on Earth. We are going to look at three corruption degrees on planet Earth. Our world today is troubled by the vector of corruption. From sunrise through noonday to sunset, and even during the night time, Mankind today is treading on the grounds of corruption. And we are going to highlight the three corruption degrees of this planet. Namely, production corruption, two, distribution corruption, and three, Consumption, corruption. Now these 
are the vectors of corruption that germinate uh, from the unique science, social science of economics. For own information, economics is that branch of knowledge or social science that basically hangs on three pillars. Production, distribution, and then consumption of wealth or goods and services. And I would like you to know in a very special way that there is no subject that affects man today that God's way does not address. One of the most critical subjects in the Bible record where God has decided to put a lot of emphasis, it is the subject of economics. Rooted down deep in God's word. And so the three corruption degrees of planet Earth hang on the pillars of economics, production, distribution, and then consumption. If you are going to look for the definition of corruption, the surface definition of corruption is, is, is barely being dishonest. Or when you are a person that is given to double dealings. But tonight, I would like you to understand corruption from the world of industry and politics in the way it is defined. Corruption in the domains of politics is basically the abuse of power for private gain. The abuse of power for private gain. So when we hear about corruption in the papers of today, the papers of Africa, the papers of Europe, and even the United States without excluding Asia, when we hear about corruption, They are referring to that abuse of power for private gain. And this is the dimension we want to take in keeping with God's word so that we may know how to live in this present age as far as God is concerned. And for own information, when we talk about economics, economics is a sector that is in God's hands. And so please follow very closely. Economics is a sector that is comprehensively in God's hands. Such that when we are going to look at corruption this evening, we may see how the plan of redemption comes in so closely to allow our steps move so well and steadily under tenets of godliness. Economics belongs to God. From the very production point, through distribution, and all the way up to consumption of wealth or goods and services. Economics is not an idea from Africa, and neither is it an idea from India. Economics is not a European idea 
or an idea that comes from the United States of America. Economics remains a divine idea. And we we'll do well tonight to follow very closely. Because economics belongs to God right from production through distribution and all the way up to consumption. And when I talk about production corruption, mark this one. Today in the field of economics, production begins at the very production point. Corruption begins at the production point of wealth. And remember that corruption is the abuse of power for personal gain. Corruption begins right at production, where people want to use their power and even influence for private gain. And if you are an employing organization, and then you put forward some interviews, you want to advertise interviews for employment as an entity or an organization or a company. You want to do so because you'd like to appear like you're transparent. You put an advert in media that you are looking for some secretaries or an accountant or whatever position because you want to place them at the very production point. And because corruption begins right at the production point, more often than not, even before you finally select somebody who can take the job, you already know who will pick it. At the production point, you already know who will take the job. All because you are looking at such things as who belongs to my group? Who belongs to my group? And because you know somebody who belongs to your group, even though you are going through the process of interviews, and yet because of your influence, You'd want to use it for private gain so that somebody who is perhaps your relative comes in. Because you know that through your relative, you are also going to gain. And so we find corruption beginning at the very production point. Because we don't understand that economics is actually in God's hand. We want to believe economics is an idea that comes from Africa or perhaps Europe or Australia. And when we come to the distribution point, corruption is reigning. Corruption is taking control. Because when, when, when the goods and resources are finally produced, they must be distributed. According to the dictates of economics, that which has been produced must be distributed. And I want you to know that when things are now being distributed, too many of them do not reach their intended destination. A lot of things go missing while being distributed. They don't reach where they're supposed to reach. And that's why we have distribution corruption. You are using your power for private gain. Because you don't understand that economics belongs to God. 
You talk about the last part of economics, which is very critical, consumption. There is also corruption. At the last part of economics, consumption. You don't eat with all the people that you need to eat with. Right at the consumption level, too many people are not eating with the rest of the people that need to be part and parcel of the budget. One section of society is given the food. Another section of society is going hungry. Consumption, corruption. And these are the vectors that are spoiling Africa, United States, Europe, and Asia. Even to the borders of those that worship God. Because we don't understand that economics belongs to God. Right from production through distribution all the way up to consumption. Why am I saying that economics belongs to God? Take note of Psalms 24 and verse 1. The Bible record says the earth is the Lord. And everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalms 50 and verse 10. For every animal of the forest is mine. And the cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible record is very clear that God owns planet Earth. He says, this is my world. All the material possession of Africa, the United States, talk about India. God is saying, everything on this planet Earth is mine. Including cattle on a thousand hills. The animals that we see in the plains of Masingo and Mutare, here in Great Zimbabwe, apart from Kenya, Nigeria, India, and Australia, world over, all these things God is saying they belong to me. Economics from production through distribution all the way up to consumption is in God's hands. Can I hear somebody say amen out there? Follow very closely as to why economics belongs to God. Because right at the production point, according to Exodus 20 and verse 9, God's word says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. I am giving you six days to labor. Working is a divine mandate. Because economics belongs to God right from the production point. God says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Working or employment. Working is not an idea from Zimbabwe. Working is not an idea from Zambia. Working is not an idea that comes from Singapore. Working is a divine idea. Six days thou shalt labor. God wants everyone to be at the production point. Six days you shall labor and do all your work because we are business creatures. And so God is saying, I want everyone to labor. I want everyone to work I want everyone to be productive. I am placing you at the very beginning of economics. I am placing you at the production point and I am giving you six days because economics belongs to me. 
Can I hear somebody say amen out there? Hosanna in the highest. Follow very closely. And that's why in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, a very interesting portion of scripture, and it says, even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, let him not eat. Because, because working is a divine idea. A biblical mandate. And Paul is giving that emphasis by saying, we have given you a rule if somebody does not want to be at the production point of economics. Let him not eat. And if you think eating is very important, then go to the production point. Because God does not believe, does not like people that are lazy and indolent from Sunday to Sabbath. The whole week you are indolent. Economics belongs to God. If you do not want to work, don't eat breakfast. Dr. Kufa was talking about breakfast, a very interesting lesson. If you don't want to be at the production point to labor and to work, don't eat. And for own information, we have people that will miss heaven because of the sin of eating without working. Very, very embarrassing. Missing heaven all because of the sin of eating without working. You don't understand that economics belongs to God from production. All the way through distribution. And for you to see this emphasis, that, that even at the distribution point, that even at the distribution point, God is involved. Take note of Exodus 20 and verse 15. Thou shalt not steal. Now this is at the distribution point because economics belongs to God. The one who owns economics is also supplying business ethics. So he says, as food is being distributed, thou shalt not steal. Because economics belongs to God. Can I hear somebody say amen out there? And yet today we have so much corruption. At the distribution point, things don't reach where they're supposed to reach. Thou shalt not steal because economics belongs to God. Let's, let's, let's go to the consumption level by way of giving a summary. Revelation 3 and verse 20. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will eat with him and he with me. Now listen, audience. Listen, audience. We worship a God who wants to eat with you. Right at the consumption level, we worship a God who wants to eat with you. He even says, I am always knocking at the door. I want you to open because when I come in, while you are eating, I want to join you. Dare not eat alone. I want you to acknowledge and to reckon that I own economics right from production through distribution 
even all the way up to consumption, put me in your budget. Hosanna in the highest. We have too much consumption, corruption today because people are eating without God in the budget. Consumption, corruption. From January through February, all the way up to December, God is not in your budget because you think economics belongs to Africa, United States, Europe, or Asia. Let me take you to a portion of scripture that tells us of a moment, a time in history when there was global economic recession in the land of Israel. Global economic recession. And it was Elijah that was sent to go and, and, and stand before Ahab and to tell him that God is not happy with you. He's the owner of economics. He's in charge of climate. Therefore, tighten your seat belt because there will be no rain in the land of Israel for three and a half years. And that's why now in the book of James 5, verse 17 and 18, we are given some history as to what happened because it says Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. I want you to know it was not easy when the land stayed without rain for three years and a half because there was serious global economic recession. That's why immediately after pronouncing doom on the land of Israel, God tells Elijah to take off and to run for his safety. 1 Kings 17, 3 and 4, very clear. As soon as Elijah said, there won't, be, there won't be rain in this land until you see my face, the Holy Ghost whispers to him and tells him to take off because he will not be safe and he will remain on the wanted list. 1 Kings 17, 3 and 4 says, The word of the Lord came to me, turn eastwards, and hide in the Kerith ravine, east of Jordan, you will drink from the brook. And I have commanded, or oh, order the ravens to feed you there. Ah, 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 ah. Elijah, take off. Please run. Turn east, and I want you to hide in a special cave that I have provided for you. Because they will search for you and search for you and search for you as long as they see that rains are not coming. There is a cave where I want you to stay. The water inside the brook is free from cholera germs or bacteria. Free from germs. I will do the maintenance when there is this crisis. I will do the maintenance of your life because economics belongs to me. I will supply you with the water in the brook. Clean even for drinking. Very clean. Don't worry. No gems. No need for chlorine. You can bath. The water is safe, certified. I have commanded ravens to feed you there. Now, this is very interesting. Because, 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 and again I say because. 
when, when the economy went biting in the land of Israel, God was failing to find somebody who could be placed at the distribution point to take bread to Elijah. Because when there is global economic recession, and God gives you ten loaves of bread to take to Elijah, by the time you reach where Elijah is, perhaps it's only two loaves of bread. Why? Because of distribution corruption. Distribution corruption. And so God says, I have my sentinels. I know whom and what to put at the distribution point so that I finish my agenda. I have commanded ravens. They will do it and supply the food to Elijah. Can I hear somebody say amen? I don't know how many of us are still faithful on this planet that has economic challenges. How many of us are still faithful like the ravens to the point where we will remain firm and true to God regardless of any type of weather or crisis or challenge. There was no distribution, corruption when it came to the ravens because it says on verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Can I hear somebody say amen? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. If in your economic life you are not faithful and you think you can fix God or fix the church by keeping to yourself that we should go to the church or to the Lord. And you think you are going to fix the church. You are simply kicking against a stone. You are stepping on a black member and your future is torn to pieces. Because we worship a God of men options. He will find ravens. At the very distribution point, he will find ravens. He will find the faithful. He will find his own. He will find those who are ready for the second coming. He will find them. Because God can never run out of ideas. He knows those who love him without reserve. Even when there is global economic recession. He put ravens right, right at the distribution point and they did their assignment without reserve. Hosanna in the highest. Do you think, do you think Elijah remained in that cave for all the three years? Not at all. First Kings 17, 7 to 9, it says, Some time later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Eh? Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zerapath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded the widow in that place to supply you with food. Beloved audience, beloved audience, and again I say, beloved audience. There came a time when the ravens stopped supplying food. The water in the brook dried up. And, 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 and Elijah begins to wonder, what has happened with my breakfast today and my, my supper? What has happened today? Have I done anything wrong? 
Have I messed up? Then the Lord says, not at all, not at all. I want you to see how much economics belongs to me. I am simply now going to put you on transfer. I am putting you on transfer to Sidon. I am putting you on transfer. And right there in Sidon, I have commanded a widow. Now take note, take note of uh, what God is placing at the consumption level. A widow. Uh, somebody whose economic resources have been depleted. Because when, when, when you lose your husband or you lose your wife, your economic muscle does not remain the same, really. Widows were known to be people that were afflicted by those circumstances. And so the Lord is saying, I am putting you on transfer to Sidon. I have commanded a widow there to feed you on daily basis from ravens to a widow. not a bank governor or a chief financial officer, but to our widow. Economics belongs to God, and he knows what to put at all these points to accomplish his will. And how I pray, how I pray that you, how I pray that you, seated here, and all of you that are listening, it be in Nigeria or Kenya, or maybe Canada, you that are listening, how I pray that God will place you at the distribution point and you remain faithful without corruption. Amen. Distribution point without corruption. And all the way up to consumption level. Let's find out what happened when Elijah arrives, arrives in this place. Some of you, you don't like transfers. Some of you, you don't like transfers because you are so much used to corruption. Because you think when you go to a new station, it will take you 10 years before you can corrupt the system. Economics belongs to God. Can I hear somebody say amen? He has arrived, and then it says, and then it says, because, because, because when he came into this area of Sidon. There are paths. When he approached to where the lady was staying, Elijah sees the same lady outside gathering sticks. The Holy Ghost says, that's the lady I have commanded to feed you. And then, and then, and then Elijah says, Mommy, hello, Mommy, how are you? The lady says, so, so. Do you know that the economy of the land, when it goes biting, it can also affect the cave. It can affect the faithful. But the moment we understand that God is in charge, we can't give up in faithfulness. We can't. Too many of us have given up on faithfulness because we think it can't work. You, you, you can't survive by being faithful, and so you give up on faithfulness. You give up. Our series are saying, don't give up. Mommy, give me water to drink. She leaves the sticks goes home. And while she's going home, Elijah shouts, Mommy, even a little morsel of bread, I'm hungry. It was at that point now on verse 12, First Kings 17 verse 12, that she said, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Now, when Elijah said, I, I want some water, there was no reaction. There was no reaction. As soon as, as soon as he said, bread, there was a reaction. Then she says, I, I don't have any bread, 
only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in the jar. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Hey? Is this the lady that God commanded to feed Elijah? Why do we seem to see communication break down? Sir, I want you to know, I wish you knew the situation in my home. Right now, as you see me, I am gathering the last sticks in history to go and prepare the last meal in history. And that meal is only enough for two people. Me and my son. No third person. The budget is tight. There seems to be some communication breakdown here because, because, because God said, I'm sending you to a lady who is a widow in Zero Park. Some of us here, we want to pretend there is communication breakdown because you think your economic status in the home is not doing so well, and so you want to believe God understands if you will not take care of his work. You want to pretend as if there is communication breakdown, that the assignment only belongs to those who have all the money. If you just have very little then you are excused from being faithful. That is consumption, corruption. Of no little magnitude, you have no faith to know that God owns economics. Then, then, then Elijah watches and observes that the lady simply needs to be reminded and, 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 and he reminds the lady and says, Mommy, have respect for the vision that God gave you. Now do this. Go and prepare that meal. Don't finish the flour. Don't finish the mealy meal. Don't finish the cooking oil. Prepare first for me and then for yourself. Put me in the budget. And the message was, and the message was, food in your pantry, food in your kitchen, food in your home will never run out until rains come. Because God has placed you also at the consumption level to avoid corruption. Because corruption is the abuse of power for private gain, should have said, it is in my power only to include two people in this budget, me and my son. I've got a question. I've got a question. How many of us, how many of us have got a question? How many of us here seated on daily basis have placed God at the very last level of economics consumption when economies go biting? We are business creatures. Take note of Matthew 17, verse 27. It says, Peter, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch. Open its mouth and you will find the four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. We are business creatures. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Now here is Christ trying to teach Peter how to do business, all right? He's trying to teach Peter how to do business. He says, now I am sending you to the lake. Go fishing. I want to teach you how to do business. Go fishing with your line. Now listen to the instructions. The very first fish you are going to catch, stop working. Stop fishing. Follow my instructions. Open it, and you will find four drachma coin. 
that very first fish you are going to catch is one of my bank accounts. I want to show you and to teach you that I can never get stranded. I have ATMs and I can withdraw money at any time from any direction. I want to teach you how to do business. That was not Barclays Bank. It wasn't. A very special one because God is the owner of economics. And the message says, the money you are going to find is enough for you and enough for me. I am teaching you how to do business. Whatever you get is enough for you and enough for me. Now let me tell you. Let me tell you. And again I say, let me tell you. Are you aware that whatever you get as an income, no matter how small, are you aware that no matter how small your income is, it is enough for you and enough for the Lord? Are you aware? God is saying whatever you get, if you understand the economics, and how to do business, I have a share. And the moment you give me my share, your future remains bright. And your steps are free from corruption, beginning with the level of production, going through distribution, and finally exiting at the consumption level. You want to believe what you have is only enough for you and your children, and God is not involved. We have been messed up at the very production level through distribution up to consumption, messed up because we think the economy is biting. Here is Acts chapter 5. A couple, Mr. and Mrs. Ananias, a couple. They made a pledge after selling a field that the money will be taken to the Lord. They made a pledge that all this money must go to the Lord. And after the money came into their hands, remember, corruption is the abuse of power for private gain. The money was now in their hands, and they had the power to abuse that power for private gain. Honey, my, 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 my wife, I know we pledged to take all this money to the Lord, but, but look at the bills that have just come. Look at the bills that have just come. Electricity bills, water bills, and our children must go to school. Look at all these things that we need to work on. Why can't we just take, even though we made a vow, why can't we just take um, part of the money, part of the money to the church? Then we use the rest for our needs because God will understand. By the way, the name Ananias means God is gracious. God is gracious. My wife, my wife, Sapphira, you see, God is gracious. He understands our weaknesses. He is not like human beings. He is gracious. So if we won't take everything now, he will understand because God is gracious. He now begins to fumble around and to play with God's grace. Too many of us in Africa, United States, Asia, 
and Europe are messing around with God's grace because we don't even understand it. Acts 5, this one says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept part of the money for himself, but brought the rest at the apostles' feet. Verse 5 and 6. Then Peter said to Ananias, How is it that Satan has filled your heart, that you have lied to the Holy Spirit, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. This is the shortest burial program I have ever seen in the solar system. Shortest burial program I have ever seen in the solar system. While he was coming, while he was coming, bringing part of the money, the Holy Ghost whispers to Peter and say, this man is trading and, and living with distribution corruption. What he is bringing is not all that should have come to the Lord. There is distribution corruption. Tell him what he has done. Ananias falls down dead. Then, then he saw like four unofficial deacons around there and called them, come and pick this corpse. Bury him over there without announcing on radio that there is a funeral. What a shameful death. What a shameful burial that will lead to a shameful resurrection. All because of production corruption that goes all the way through distribution up to the consumption level, they began to eat that which should have gone to the Lord. He was buried. But now take note of verse 7 and 10, all the way up to 10, it says, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. The entire family is now finishing in quick succession. And then it says, Then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. All because of distribution, corruption. That which should have reached at the feet of the apostles could not reach. And that's why God decided to use ravens way back yonder. You see, three hours later, she was not even aware that the husband was dead. I don't know what she was trying to fall up. And perhaps as she was going and approaching where Peter was, she was trying to pretend that she's very religious, very religious, and maybe she was even singing. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, my prayer, my aim is high. Yeah, ground. Crescendos began to appear when she was now approaching uh, where Peter was. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on her, then stable end, a higher plane than I have found. 
Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Peter says, Mommy, how much were you supposed to bring? She lies. Then he says, I thought you were coming to apologize and to confess over your sin that you committed with your husband. How come that that's what you are coming to confirm to me at the church? That what you brought is what was supposed to be brought. Look at those four young men. They have just come from burying your husband. She fell down dead. Killed by God's grace. Because they were saying, God is gracious. God is gracious. He understands. Even if we will fail at this point in time, he understands he's not like us. Ananias means God is gracious and he was killed by God's grace which he was messing around with. Because Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12 declares, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men and it teaches us to say no to sin and ungodliness, and to live self-controlled, upright lives in this present age. So God's grace is a lecturer, an international lecturer. It is a teacher that, that tells us to say no to sin. Once your sins are forgiven by grace, grace takes you into a classroom and says, sit here. You now need to go and sin no more to live self-controlled, upright lives in this present age in Africa and the United States and Europe so that you can live a life free from corruption. Can I hear somebody say amen out there? Killed. By God's grace. For your own information, When the two were buried, the children were not aware that mom and dad are gone. They remained behind with stolen property. The money that should have come to the Lord remained with the children, and that's what they were using for their livelihood, stolen property. Is that what you call investment? When you are leaving behind stolen property for your children to use. Alas, hey ho, and hey ho, alas, we don't understand investment. We die and we are leaving our children using stolen property. Listen, Leviticus 27, verse 30. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain, from the soil, or fruit, from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Malachi 3, 10 and 11, bring the whole tithe into my storehouse, Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Not floodgates of Kariba, but floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Because economics belongs to God, he owns the entire world. He says, every time you have your increase, I want you to know that whatever you have, is enough for you, and I have a share. And I call it 10% of your income. As a sign that you belong to me. As a sign that you believe I am the one who gave you employment. Loyalties must come in. Then I will give you overflowing blessings. 
overflowing. Now listen, Zimbabwe. And again I say, listen. God is talking about overflowing blessings. Overflowing in divine economics. That which overflows is not wastage. That is not wastage. That which overflows, that's not carelessness. That is not wastage. In divine economics, that which overflows goes down to formulate fountains and reservoirs for neighbors also, including impalas, to benefit. Can I hear somebody say amen? Because when God is blessing you, you can't remain selfish at the consumption level. That is corruption of no little magnitude. By the way, by the way, 10% of your income is right in your check. Right in your hands. You have the power to make any decision. You have the power to, to abuse your, 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 your energy and power for private gain so that you can use tithe on your project. Corruption, consumption every month when you get your income. You gave up five years ago, returning tithe because the economy is biting. You gave up, but God is saying, I am looking for people that will understand that the economics belongs to me and they will never give up regardless of any setting on planet Earth. Can I hear somebody say amen out there? Osana in the highest. Don't give up. Lest you die on the spot. You have stopped eating with God. Consumption corruption. You like employing those who belong to your group and perhaps relatives. Production corruption. That which belongs to the Lord doesn't reach where it is supposed to reach, like Ananias. Distribution corruption. And my prayer and my prayer, my prayer is that God will touch all of us that are here listening to God's word and all of you that are listening to his word right now. May God give you strength of will, stability of purpose, and even more stamina to be identified with him all the way through until history closes. What you talk of as being economics, God talks about it as being stewardship. Economics belongs to God. Hosanna in the highest. Is there somebody? Somebody. Somebody? Is there somebody who has been living a life of corruption from production through distribution all the way up to consumption? You have heard God's word and you are saying, Oh Lord, I seek an amendment in my Christian living, in my lifestyle. As an economic being, serve me now by your grace and allow me to live by your grace without messing it up. Is that your desire? For God forgive you so that you can begin better. Can I see you raising your hand? If you are in the audience. And those of you that are watching this program through media telecast, I want to appeal to you that God can forgive you and set you free. Economics belongs to God. 
then your future will remain bright. And that's why in the country of Zimbabwe there is a song. They sing in aspiration that they are ready for the second coming of the Lord. They sing it so well in Zimbabwe. Let's sing it. Hama nerimwezu batichano fambira kudenga. Nerimwezu batichano fambira kudenga. Nerimwezu ba. Nerimwezu ba. Nerimwezu batichano fambira kudenga. Hama nerimwezu batichano fambira kudenga. Neri mwezu batucha no fambira kudenga Neri mwezu ba Neri mwezu ba Neri mwezu ba tucha no fambira kudenga Shall we pray Our loving father tonight We have been pricked by your word because we are living lifestyles of corruption from production through distribution all the way up to consumption. Because we have failed to understand that economics belongs to you and that working is not an idea from Africa, United States, Europe, or Asia. And that's why we are messing around and we are dying in disgrace. And we are being buried in disgrace like Ananias and we will be given a resurrection of shame. No hope beyond the grave. Accept our apology, O oh Lord, our confession. We are sorry this day forward. Show us your glory on daily basis until you come. Because we pray it in Jesus, our hope of future glory, the honor of economics, the foundation of permanent joy, and the backbone of triumph on the platform of worship. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Hosanna in the highest, and God bless you. Amen, church. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. May it find a place in our hearts. May it find expression in our lives. Thank you so much all for coming here tonight to share with us this beautiful word. Don't forget, the gospel is like us as beggars having discovered food somewhere. And the best thing we can do with that is not to enjoy it alone, but to call other beggars, so to speak, to come and enjoy with us. With such a beautiful message, wouldn't you want tonight? Let me see those who tonight say, by God's grace, I want to call somebody to come in tomorrow and enjoy the way. Let me see by show of hands. They're coming, they're not coming. It's really not so much your burden. Yours is to go and invite. Come, hear the word. And so tomorrow, thank you so much. Tomorrow, at 5.30 May, you'll be found here, ready to hear the word, to enjoy the blessings that God has prepared for us. Don't forget, on Sundays and Wednesdays, there will be a health expo, absolutely, totally, completely free. Bring your friends, bring your family, don't look too far. If you're at work, bring your colleagues, your bosses, your employees. If you're at school, call your schoolmates, your classmates, your friends. If you're in the neighborhood, call your neighbor. Tell them, come, let's enjoy the word together. Go tonight with God's blessing as you go. Carry each other. That's the way we do it here.